one of the most difficult, yet the most important conversations we can have with others is on the topic of abortion. Often such talk is avoided, perhaps, and folks do not offend, or perhaps we really aren't sure where we stand on the issue. Or maybe even we are uncomfortable with how we might effectively discuss the matter with another. Well, tonight, we have the rare opportunity to hear from someone who can help. It gives me great pleasure to introduce you to our speaker this evening. Hailing originally from Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, now living in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, and soon moving elsewhere, further east of Canada. She has given pro-life presentations across North America, as well as in the United Kingdom, Latvia, and Costa Rica. She has spoken at many post-secondary institutions, such as the University of Toronto, York University, University of Calgary, Johns Hopkins University, George Washington University, and the University of Sussex in England. She has debated abortion advocates, such as Ron Fitzsimmons, Executive Director of the National Coalition of Abortion Providers, and Dr. Jan Narvison, philosophy professor and recipient of the Order of Canada. She has debated physicians who do abortions, which includes debating a late-term abortionist in front of medical students at the University of Western Ontario's Sulich School of Medicine and Dentistry. Her audiences are vast, including high school, churches of various denominations, seminaries, and pro-life organizations. She holds a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from the University of British Columbia and a certification with distinction in healthcare ethics from the National Catholic Bioethics Center right here in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. She is a co-founder and the executive director of the Canadian Center for bioethical reform. Tonight, we have the rare privilege of having her to talk to us about the most important issue facing us today, abortion. And she speaks to us about how to end abortion in our day. Please join me in welcoming Stephanie Gray. Thank you very much, Brother Dan, and thank you all for coming out this evening. It is a joy to be here. I always love coming to the United States, so it's a pleasure to come through on my move across Canada to Toronto. I decided to go a little south as well as east, because it's always more fun driving through the States. I want to begin by sharing with you a quote from a woman who was a lecturer, an author, and a suffragette. And she said the following, she said, I am only one, but still I am one. I cannot do everything, and still I can do something. And because I cannot do everything, I will not refuse to do the something that I can do. That lecturer, that author, that activist was a woman who was blind and deaf. Her name was Helen Keller. How is it possible for someone who could not see and could not hear to become an author and a lecturer and to be an activist who fought for women's rights to vote? Well, it was possible because she walked the talk, because she heeded her own words. She focused not on the fact that she was merely one, but that she was one. She focused not on that she couldn't do everything, but that she could do something. She realized the power of one. Tonight's presentation is about the power of one, the power of each one of us to be salt and light in this world, the power of each one of us as instruments to be used by God on this earth to transform this very wounded, broken culture of death into a culture of life. It is our call to build the kingdom here on earth. And that requires transforming the culture, which necessitates that we engage the culture. If we wish to change the culture, we must engage the culture. Wherever we are, whatever our vocation, our placement, our capacities, we are called to reach out to those around us, not merely seizing opportunities that arise, but making opportunities, 
creating situations in which we can engage people, particularly on this issue of abortion, in order to be a voice for the youngest of our kind, to be a voice for preborn children. What I want to do this evening is equip you to be able to have a dialogue with everyday people in our society, whether they're people in parishes, people in the workplace, family members, friends. How do we engage them on the issue of abortion in a way that persuades them to come to the pro-life perspective instead of embracing the view of being moderate on abortion, as people may call it, and to be pro-choice regarding abortion? How do we make this change? How do we engage people? And when we engage them, how do we be effective? Well, there are three things that I'm going to go through tonight that I hope you will take and, and, and make use of in your everyday life. I'm going to talk about how we can explain to the culture how abortion is a human rights violation, a grave injustice demanding our very serious response. The second thing I'm going to do is talk about how we can make the scientific case for the preborn being humans just like us. And the third thing I'm going to do is talk about how philosophically we can make the case for the personhood of preborn children so that people realize they have the same right to life as you and me. And by imparting this information to the culture that abortion is a human rights violation, that the preborn are human persons, then we can convict them with this truth that abortion is something that should be rejected as opposed to being embraced. So the first thing I wanted to focus on then is how do we package our message to the culture that abortion is a moral wrong, a human rights violation, as opposed to a woman's right? Well, in this culture, this modern day culture, where we are a very visual culture, I would say if we want to communicate the injustice of abortion, we have to communicate in a way which resonates with a visual culture, a culture that thinks and learns visually. How many of you growing up were told by your parents, eat your vegetables, they're starving kids in Africa? Any of you? <laughs> All right, I was told that too. Now, how many of you started eating your vegetables? <laughs> I have because I travel uh, in my work and have to stay in host homes and you just can't be rude and not eat the food in front of you. So anyways, many of us were told that by our parents. And a friend of mine was giving a presentation once and he says, you know, my mom always said to me, eat your vegetables, bread. They're starving kids in Africa. And he said, you know what? That never meant much to me. He said, that never meant much to me until I went to Africa. And he said, then I saw starvation. And I held starvation. And he said, suddenly everything my mother had said to me for all those years took on a whole new meaning in my life. Correspondingly, we can talk to people about abortion and why it's wrong and how it's a crime against humanity until we're blue in the face. But much like starvation and suffering in other parts of the world, often it's not until we really see it that we can understand just how grave a particular issue is. Have any of you seen the movie Amazing Grace about William Wilberforce? A few of you. A very powerful film about the Christian politician who fought tirelessly and successfully to end the slave trade in Great Britain. And the movie's called Amazing Grace because his pastor, John Newton, who penned the hymn Amazing Grace, was a former slave ship owner. But he repented of his ways and he guided people like Wilberforce to be a positive difference in the world. I'd like to play for you a scene from this movie in which Wilberforce is speaking with John Newton. And listen closely to what John Newton is saying about the realization of his past and the burden he has carried with what he has done. I my memory's fading. I remember two things very clearly. I'm a great sinner and Christ is a great savior. You must publish it. Blow a hole in that boat with it. Damn them with it. I wish I could remember all their names. My 20,000 ghosts. They all have names. Beautiful African names. We call them with just grunts. Noises. We were apes, 
Once was blind, but now I see. It's good. Thank you. There's a blank slide. John Newton realized it wasn't until he came to terms and wrote down all the horrible things that he had done that the scales <clears throat> fell from his eyes and he could finally see its gravity. And he wanted people like Wilberforce to circulate that message to those who were using t sugar in their tea and didn't really comprehend the blood and the death that was the toll of obtaining that sugar. And only when people could realize how they were getting what they wanted and how evil that was would they change their ways. And when it comes to abortion, there's great blindness in our culture. First of all, abortion is a procedure we don't see. We can drive past hospitals in which abortions occur. We can go past clinics in which abortions occur. And we can go on with our everyday ordinary lives as though children aren't being killed. But we have to ask ourselves, if we were driving down the road and a two-year-old was being killed on the street corner as we were passing by, would we keep driving? Or would we stop and intervene? There's a double standard going on. We aren't responding and intervening with the gravity of, in response to the gravity of abortion, the way we would if born children were being killed, because for the most part, we're blind to what's going on. It is hidden from us. And then some people say, well, if abortionists actually do abortions, they're not blind, they're seeing it, and they manage to keep doing it. Well, interestingly, abortionists try to separate themselves from what they're doing, to try to not view what they're doing, because if they do see it, it's hard to carry through with it. In fact, about a year and a half to two years ago, a very interesting documentary was released on YouTube about an undercover operation that occurred in a Spanish abortion clinic. A journalist posed as a physician. He went to this late-term abortion clinic in Spain and applied for a job. He got accepted for a job, and his first shift was to shadow the current abortionist. And he went in as a journalist, they didn't realize that, with hidden cameras, little pinhole cameras all over him audio, video. And so he's shadowing this abortionist, and then there's abortion that's about to happen on a teenager. And it's a 20, 21 week abortion. And so you see through this pinhole camera everything about the woman. She's laying there naked on the table. But as the medical professionals realize the moment is coming where the dead, having been killed, baby is about to come out of her, you suddenly see through this camera one of the medical personnel grab a white sheet. They lay it over the woman. Then they get a garbage bag. They lay it under the woman. And just as the baby is coming out, the abortionist grabs the sheet from the top. With her other hand, she grabs the garbage bag, and the baby is pulled out, and they don't look. Then the aborted baby in the garbage bag is placed over on a counter. The undercover journalist walks over and begins to look at the baby and stroke the face and touch the hand. And then you hear an exchange in Spanish subtitled on the screen between the, the journalist posing as the physician and the actual physician. And the physician looks at the journalist and says, I never look at that. And surprised, you hear the journalist say, never? And the abortionist says, never? And the journalist says, never? And she says, never, ever. And he says, why? And she says, because I don't like to look at it. How is she able to do what she does? Because she's blind to it. But as John Newton once said, I once was blind and now I see. And he and Wilberforce and the many abolitionists sought to transform their culture by exposing the injustice that people were blind to. Another example within that movement 
is Thomas Clarkson, played by this actor within the film Amazing Grace. Thomas Clarkson sought to change public opinion so that William Wilberforce could change public policy. And it was Thomas Clarkson who traveled across England to get first-hand testimony from people who had worked on the slave ships. And he would compile all this testimony and give it to people like Wilberforce so they could circulate it to the politicians and the public. Clarkson also purchased chains and shackles, and every time he gave a presentation, he would do a visual demonstration for his audiences. In a time before photography, he recognized the power of pictures, and he would do a visual demonstration of how the human beings were being chained together like animals. In the year 1788, this diagram was sketched. It's the inside of a slave ship called Brooks. It showed with measurements of feet and inches exactly how the slaves were packed in like cargo. Although it may not be shocking to us who are used to many more graphic imagery. Nonetheless, in 1788, this was a very shocking image. The abolitionists had people put it on the walls of pubs, homes, in newspapers. And this became the most powerful tool the abolitionists had at its fingertips to horrify people about the slave trade. If you fast forward into the 20th century, you have here in America the anti-child labor movement. There was an anti-child labor activist by the name of Lewis Hine, who was a skilled photographer. And Hine's job was to travel across the United States to places like the mines of Pennsylvania, to take pictures of children working long hours in dangerous conditions, being robbed of their childhood. And as these pictures were distributed to the public, people became uncomfortable with child labor. So much so that by 1920, the number of child laborers here in America was cut in half from what it had been in 1910, only 12 years after Heinz's campaign of taking photographs. Then you have the Civil Rights Movement. This is a boy by the name of Emmett Till. How many of you are familiar with this name or the picture, Emmett Till? What if I said the name Rosa Parks? More hands go up. And I find that many people, if not all, are familiar with Rosa Parks, that tired black woman who refused to give up her bus seat to a white man in 1955. And less are familiar with the story of Emmett Till, who also lived at that same time period. In fact, that year of 55, when he was 14, he went on a vacation from Chicago, where he was living, down to Money, Mississippi. While in Mississippi, one day he visited a corner store, and it's alleged that as he left the corner store, he looked at the white woman behind the counter, whistled at her, and said, Bye, baby, and walked out. Being from Chicago, Emmett thought nothing of it. Being from the South, the other boys around him were very concerned about what he had just done. Well, several days later, Emmett was to learn his lesson when in the darkness of 2 o'clock in the morning, the husband of that white woman and his half-brother showed up at Emmett's uncle's home. They kidnapped him, drove him off to a distance, beat him savagely, shot him in the head, tied his body to a 75-pound cotton gin fan, and then threw it in the river. Days later, his body was recovered, the authorities put it in a coffin, nailed the coffin shut, and shipped it to a funeral home in Chicago. The director of the funeral home had made a promise to Mississippi authorities that he would keep the coffin nailed shut. Now, Emmett's mother went to the funeral home and wanted to have one last look at her son's body. But Rayner, that man in charge, refused to go back on his promise. Emmett's mother, being a determined woman, basically said, if you don't open the coffin, I will. Rayner changed his mind, he opened the coffin, and she began to look at her son's body, staring at his feet, and slowly moving her gaze upwards towards his face. When she got to his face, she saw that his tongue had been choked out. His nose was smashed in as though a meat chopper had been taken to it. One of his eyeballs was lying on his cheek, and there was a bullet hole visible in his head. When Emmett's mother saw the mutilated body of her son, she demanded that there be an open casket funeral because, she said, I want the world to see what they did to my boy. 50,000 people lined in the streets of Chicago to enter the church and view Emmett's body. Parents brought their children. Black and white media wrote and talked about what had happened. Black media through Jet Magazine actually published a photograph of Emmett's face. And there's a researcher in America by the name of Dr. Clenora Hudson-Weems 
who has written her PhD thesis in a book ultimately on this incident. And in those, she argues, this was the catalyst for the civil rights movement. She says in her research of black and white people who lived during the time of segregation, they credit this image and this story as motivating them to action. Now, if that's true, why today are we more familiar with Rosa Parks and less familiar with Emmett Till? Well, in one of her essays, Dr. Weems provides some insight in response to that question. And the insights from Emmett's second cousin who said, historians like to talk about the good and the bad, but they don't want to deal with the ugly. And the ugliness of racism is not a white man telling a black woman to give him her bus seat, as bad as that is. But rather it is the confident home invasion, kidnapping and murder of a 14 year old black youth and the exoneration by jury of the youth's apparent killers. What's interesting is this incident occurred 100 days before that very famous Rosa Parks incident. And Parks said she stayed seated on the bus because she was thinking about injustices like that which had been inflicted upon Till. You take other brutalization directed towards civil rights activists and again we see the reinforcement that when you engage the culture, if you wish to change the culture, you need to expose the injustice. Everywhere the civil rights activists went, they were brutalized by white authorities, and Dr. King made sure that when his activists were peacefully protesting in the streets, the media was there to capture their brutalization. In fact, there was one protest in the 60s where uh, a Life uh, magazine photographer by the name of Flip Schalke was taking photos of this event. And at one point, one of the civil rights activists was knocked down, he was wounded. So Schalke dropped his camera, and he ran over to help the civil rights activist. Well, at the end of that protest, Dr. King went over to Flip Schulke and he scolded him for putting his camera down. He looked at Schulke and he said, your job is to document what's happening to us. Don't put the camera down. Your job is to document what's happening to us. Preborn children, however, cannot ask that of us because they are so vulnerable and so weak that they can't make the requests that the civil rights activists made of the reporters of their day. This is one of many billboards used in the state of Montana beginning in the year 2005. Back then, the state of Montana ranked fifth in the nation for crystal meth abuse. The authorities came together and said, look, this is such a serious problem, we need a serious response. How do we decrease the rate of crystal meth use in our state? And so because young people are very visual, they said, we need a very graphic, visual campaign. Let's get billboards, let's get commercials. It's not even been a decade, and the state of Montana now ranks 39th in the nation for crystal meth abuse. In less than a decade, they have shifted from 5th to 39th because of the power of imagery. Correspondingly, if we wish to grab people's hearts, to break their hearts for what breaks God's heart. Then as all these other movements realize the need to expose injustice to end injustice, so too do we need to expose the injustice of abortion to end the injustice of abortion. We need to bring what's in darkness into the light. What I'm going to do now is play a video for you that's a tool I hope you will use whether in a parish, whether in a school, whether with a friend, a colleague, a tool you can use to help get people to a place where the scales fall from their eyes and they see that what is perceived as choice is in fact a human rights violation. Of course, it's very important whenever we communicate the pro-life truth to people that we remind people that while the truth can be hard-hitting, where sin increase grace abounds all the more. And we want to remind people that God is a loving and forgiving God. And so no matter what people have done, we can find freedom. But to be healed requires being forgiven. To be forgiven requires repenting. To repent requires taking ownership of what we've done. Going through that painful process of shifting from denial and rationalization into a place of ownership of our guilt. Pictures can move people out of denial into responsibility. 
Cunningham has said injustice that is invisible inevitably becomes tolerable. <clears throat> How is it possible that over a million preborn children are being dismembered, decapitated, and disemboweled in our own backyard annually because it is invisible? But the reverse of that statement is true. Injustice that is made visible inevitably becomes intolerable. The history of social movements, a few of which I highlighted, shows us that. Our own experience with the pictures shows us that. I recently, in my, my current home of Calgary, held in my arms a baby boy who was born because his mom canceled her abortion appointment because she saw the pictures. And as I said before the video, we can also help move women out of denial. A couple summers ago, I was standing with my colleagues where we try to provide the most holistic message possible. Not only that abortion kills, but that it hurts women. And as we were standing on the street, my job that day was to have no signs, but to just observe passers-by. And when I saw someone looking at the messages, my job was to walk up to them and say, what do you think about abortion? And so I noticed a young woman had just stepped off the sidewalk, a crosswalk onto the sidewalk. This is precisely what was staring at her, and she was staring at. And so I approached her, I said, what do you think about abortion? Her reaction to my question was to describe the aborted baby. She talked about its ribs, its fingers. And I, I said, yeah, and that's just the first trimester when a majority of abortions happen. I noticed at that point her eyes began to fill, fill with tears. And I was worried that she might have had an abortion. And my way of trying to draw that out so that I could minister to her was to say, do you know anyone who's had an abortion? She said, yes. I said, I know people too. And then she said, I have to go. And she turned and she started to walk away. And so I went up to my, my friend Anita here who regrets her abortion. I said, Anita, quick, I need one of your business cards. And she has these little cards with a toll-free help number that post-abortive women can call. By the time she found it, this girl was about a block away. I grabbed the card, I'm running that block. And as I approached the girl, I said, excuse me, excuse me, and she stopped. I ran towards her, stopped when I got to her. I said, I just want to give you this card for your friends. I said, if any of them need someone to talk to, they regret what they've done, this, this can help them. And those tears that I had seen fill her eyes just a few moments before were spilling down her cheeks. And so I very gently said, did you have one? And she said, yes. And I said, I am sorry for your loss. And after we hugged, she said, nobody told me it looked like that. And she made the choice she did only three months before in a city a few hours north of us because nobody told her 
it looked like that. And upon reflection of that incident, it occurred to me, if we withhold a truth that we know will set people free, then their sin of commission becomes our sin of omission. So what have I gone through so far? That if we wish to change the culture, we must engage the culture. And when we engage the culture, we need to put forward information which will change their understanding of what the injustice is, because they don't perceive it as an injustice. And the history of social movements has shown that time and again, pictures are a powerful tool to wake people up to what is happening. As I mentioned, the other two things I want to do in my presentation tonight is give you the tools you can use to make the case for the preborn being human scientifically, as well as make a philosophical case for them to be acknowledged as persons who have the same right to life as you and me. Because what I have found in the abortion debate is a lot of abortion advocates deny the human personhood status of preborn children, which means our job is to prove their human personhood status. Before I get into the specifics of that, what I want to talk about is the three qualities we need to have when we engage the culture. There's an American group out in California called Stand to Reason that talks about being an ambassador. Now they apply their, their concept of ambassador to being a Christian ambassador. But what they talk about in terms of representing Christ is something that very much applies to representing the pro-life movement. He says when we are going to be ambassadors or representatives to an idea, if we want to be good ones, if we want to be persuasive and winsome, we need three qualities. He said we need knowledge, wisdom, and character. In other words, we need an accurately informed mind. That's where we get our science and our philosophy and the facts about abortion. All of that falls under knowledge. But then it's not enough to simply have the knowledge. We need wisdom. We need an artful method. We need to take the knowledge we have, package it in such a way that when we communicate, it persuades. So wisdom involves things like being like Socrates, asking good questions. In fact, asking more questions than we do make declarative statements. Wisdom also involves being like Jesus, who not only taught by asking questions, but told lots of parables. Using analogies and stories that take the familiar, things people can relate to and understand, and insert our principle into that thing so they can grasp it. So wisdom, that artful method, we want to ask questions, we want to tell stories or use analogies, then we want to illustrate our point, visually as I just did, but in other ways as well, that help people grasp certain concepts. And then finally, we need character. We need an attractive manner. We need to make sure that how we come across in terms of our tone of voice, our mannerisms, the look in our eyes as we're staring at the person we're talking to, that all of that complements and commends our message. What is our message? At its core, the dignity of the person, the inestimable worth and unrepeatability of every human being. We're talking about the pre-born, but we're also talking about the born. If our message is about respect, then those we dialogue with must feel that we respect them. Not their bad ideas, but them as individuals of great value as well. One of my favorite quotes is that of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who said, whom you would change, you must first love, and they must know that you love them. So to be good pro-life ambassadors, we need that accurately informed mind, knowledge, that artful method, wisdom, and that attractive manner, character. So bearing that in mind, let's move into the case we need to make for the human personhood of preborn children. How do we take what can seem very difficult to wrap our minds around, perhaps scientifically, and all the nuances and different stages, the morula and blastocyst stage and all of that stuff, all the perhaps philosophical ideas that you're taught here at the seminary and beyond, and how to communicate it in layman's terms to the everyday, ordinary individual in the culture? Well. I'm big on clarity and simplicity. You know, the KISS principle, right? Keep it simple, stupid. Keep it simple, silly, however you want to say it. We want to keep our message as simple and clear as possible. And that means when we're dialoguing with people, we know how clear and simple the debate is. The unplanned pregnancy, from an emotional perspective, a psychological perspective, a social perspective, can be complicated. But the morality of abortion, whether the act of abortion is right or wrong, is very simple. It's a black and white issue. 
I have to say, Stephanie Gray, I've been given the wrong last name. Because this is one issue where there's no gray. It's great, it's very clear. It's black and white. And the way to show abortion advocates that what they often perceive is a gray issue, how it's actually a black and white issue, is to ask them why they support abortion. What circumstances they think justify abortion. Because what I find is abortion advocates often determine the rightness or wrongness of abortion based on circumstances. They'll say, look, if a woman, you know, um, you know, just wants to go on vacation and doesn't want to be pregnant, I mean, she shouldn't have an abortion. But, you know, if she's been raped and gotten pregnant from that, well, then she should have an abortion. So they look at the circumstances, and if the circumstances are difficult enough, then they justify abortion. So they say things like, well, rape is justification, or poverty, or health problems for the baby, and we can see on and on the list goes. To be pregnant in any of these circumstances, unexpectedly pregnant, would be hard, would be difficult. And as pro-lifers, we can agree with abortion advocates, it would be hard to be unexpectedly pregnant in those circumstances. That's not where the debate lies, because we agree on that. The question is, May we directly and intentionally kill innocent human beings when we're in difficult circumstances. Now, we could just say that, but will they get it? So we want to use some wisdom. We want to find some common ground. We want to come up with analogies, and we want to ask good questions. So when someone says, for example, what about rape? I start with common ground. And common ground means only being finding common ground or where you have common ground. It doesn't mean saying I agree with you on something you don't agree with them on. But if someone were to say, what about rape? I can say, I can agree with you that rape is horrible. There are no words to describe the trauma that that inflicts on women. I have friends who have been sexually assaulted, some of whom molested as children. They are still working through that decades later. So we find common ground that rape is horrible then we come up with some form of an analogy that involves not a pre-born child, but a born child in a similar set of circumstances. And we use the analogy to ask the question of the abortion supporter if they would ever kill the born child for the difficult circumstance, like they would kill a pre-born child for the difficult circumstance. Many years ago, I was at Penn State University uh, doing one of our, our pro-life exhibits that, that we do with my organization. And I was debating with a young student about abortion. And he said, but what about rape? And I said, well, imagine this for a moment. Let's say you've got a woman who has consensual sex with her husband on Monday. The following day, when she's walking home from work late at night, she's raped by a stranger. One month later, she discovers she's pregnant. She doesn't know now who the father of her child is. It could be the husband. It could also be the rapist. So I said to him, let's imagine that she hopes it's her husband's child. She carries on with the pregnancy. After the baby is born, they do a paternity test. The test results come back and reveal the father's child, or the child's father, rather, is not her husband. It's the rapist. After telling that analogy, I asked him a question. May we kill the newborn child because of the father's crime? And he said, oh, you're right. I never thought of it that way. We can't. I said, exactly. Then why would we ever kill the preborn child because of the father's crime? Now, some abortion advocates will say, unlike this guy who was convinced, they'll say, well, wait a minute. The embryo isn't a child yet like the infant is a child. You're comparing apples to oranges. Infants are people, embryos aren't. If that's the reaction, then we can say to them, ah, oh, I think I understand now where you're coming from. You seem like a reasonable person. If I'm hearing you correctly, you would never kill a human being just because their dad committed a crime. So if I'm hearing you correctly, the fact that you support abortion tells me, as you yourself have just said, you don't think the embryo is human. That makes sense to me. Of course you're okay with killing it. Because if it actually was human, you never would. Like, you wouldn't kill the infant. But the question is, are you right about the embryo not being human? That's what we need to figure out. And take any other circumstance that abortion advocates provide. Create an analogy. Would we kill a born child because the child's mother is too young? Would we kill a two-year-old because the parents are in poverty and can't care for it? And the moment they say no to killing the born child, we ask the question, why then kill the pre-born child? They'll say, that's different. We say, why? We become like the toddler, perpetually asking her parent why. 
And they'll say, well, again, because the pre-born are potential people, the born are actual people. The moment we get that response, we say, then the real question is, are the pre-born potential people or are they actual people? When does life begin? And again, bearing in mind simplicity, I'm going to give you three questions we can ask people when making the, the discussion focus on the question of when life begins. These three questions came about as a result of a friend of mine being stuck at a red light with two bumper stickers that were pro-life on his car. And he lived in California at the time, and it was a hot day, and his window was down, and a car rolled up next to him, stopped at the red light, her window was down, she looked at his bumper stickers, and calls out to him, what do your bumper stickers mean? And his jaw just kind of dropped open, and he was trying to formulate some sentences in his mind to defend his bumper stickers. The light goes green, she drives away. And he thought to himself, if I only had 10 seconds to make the pro-life case, how would I do it? And so he developed what he calls the 10-second pro-life apologist. Not the person who in 10 seconds apologizes for being pro-life, as all of you would know, but rather someone who in 10 seconds can defend the pro-life perspective. Doing it in the form of questions so that the person we're talking to is the one doing the thinking. The three questions that Steve came up with are the three questions I used on a university student in Oklahoma just a year ago when I was at another pro-life exhibit. And he came up and he asked what I thought about abortion and we started dialoguing. He said, well, when do you say life begins? And I said, you know what? It's not about what I say. It's about what science says. It's not about me. It's not about you. The question is, what does science say about when life begins? So let me ask you a question I said, and I started with Steve's first question. I said, if something's growing, isn't it alive? And I think he was afraid about where I was going to take this, so he started to resist that. Well, no, and I said, oh, come on. Really, like, if something's growing, can't we just agree it's alive? He goes, well, wait a minute, lots of things are growing, like trees are growing. Are you saying they're alive? And I'm like, uh-huh. He goes, well, are you saying they're equal to fetuses? I said, oh, wait, I'm not saying by my first question, if we answer it positively, that if something grow is growing, indeed it's alive. I'm not saying that that's to be protected yet. But will you just agree with me? that if something's growing, it's alive. So he conceded, yes. Okay, I said, fair enough. My next question for you is this. If you have human parents, aren't you human offspring? And he's like, well, what, you know, but it's not human yet. I said, well, no, wait, would you just agree that, you know, two dogs are only gonna produce another dog, not a cat, and two cats are only gonna produce a cat. So if you have human parents, it makes sense that you are of the same species as them. And he's like, okay, fine, and I said, Steve's third question. And we humans are valuable, aren't we? If something's growing, isn't it alive? If you have human parents, aren't you human offspring? And we humans are valuable, aren't we? If you only have 10 seconds, ask those questions to get the person thinking. But if you have a little bit longer, here's how we can unpack each one of those statements. I like to start with that third one. We humans are valuable, aren't we? Say it in a tone like it's obvious, so that you're not debating the third one, you're only talking about the first two. And so the example I give to expand on that is I'll say, let's say you've got this teenager here, and it's, uh, her dad works in a workplace where you can bring your child to work once a year. And so her dad worked at what was, let's say, the World Trade Center. And let's say it was September 11th, 2001. It's take your child to work day. She goes to work with her dad. The plane crashes into the building they're in. The building implodes. She's killed. Tragedy? Yes. Why? Because humans are valuable. So then you say to the abortion advocate, let's pretend she went to work with her dad, not as a teenager, but rather as a toddler. It's September 11th, 2001, in she goes, early morning, with her dad into the World Trade Center. The plane crashes in, the building implodes, the toddler's killed. Tragedy, you ask the abortion advocate? Sure, they'll say. Right, you agree. Why? Because humans are valuable. Well, let's say the toddler is not who goes to work with her dad, but rather the infant. Let's say the dad takes his infant to work. It's September 11th, 2001. The plane crashes in, the building implodes, the infant is killed. Tragedy? Yes, the abortion advocate will say. Why, you ask? You answer it yourself, because humans are valuable, right? Well, let's imagine that it's not an infant that goes into the World Trade Center on September 11th, but rather the infant's mother goes to work on September 11th, and instead of being an infant, the mother has a fetus within her. And the plane crashes, the building implodes, the fetus is killed. Tragedy? If the fetus is human. Why? Because humans are valuable. Well, let's imagine it's not a fetus that goes into the World Trade Center on September 11th, 2001, but rather a newly conceived one-celled embryo growing in the fallopian tube of its mother. 
The plane crashes, the building implodes, the embryo's killed. Tragedy if the embryo's human. Why? Because humans are valuable. Now at that point, the abortion advocate may say, well, wait a minute, the first three were tragic situations, and the other two aren't because of the very words you used, embryo and fetus. See, it's not a human, it's an embryo or fetus. And it's at this point where we get to the second question I asked. If you have human parents, aren't you human offspring? If we want to know what something is, we ask, what are its parents? Not, is it an embryo or fetus? Because embryo and fetus are age classifications. Other species have embryos and fetuses as well. Embryo and fetus refer to how old you are. You are not an embryo at birth, nor you are, are you a fetus at fertilization. Embryo refers to, in our species, a human from fertilization to the end of eight weeks. Then, from the beginning of nine weeks to the point of birth, you're called a fetus. But then we have another label when you're at a different age category, and that is infant, and then toddler, and then teenager. These things tell us how old we are, but not what we are. If we want to know what we are, we ask what are our parents. And as long as no one wants to reopen the debate about the humanness of women, as long as no one wants to open a debate about the humanness of men, then there is no reason to call into question the humanness of their offspring. So then that brings me to the first question that we asked. If something's growing, isn't it alive? And indeed, we can conclude that the preborn starting in the embryonic period are indeed alive. Why? Because they're growing. That one cell divides into two, and then four, and then eight, and 16, and so forth. Now at that point, the abortion advocate may say, well, wait a minute. If you're saying that we should just protect living human things, then are you saying sperm and egg are equal to embryos? Because if it's from a human, then sperm is human and it's alive, and egg is human from a woman and it's alive, so you know, are we to protect those like we're to protect the embryos? And this is where we make an important distinction between parts and wholes. The sperm or the egg, while human and alive, are human parts, much like my hand or my foot, which are human parts, but not me. They could be chopped off and we wouldn't say, oh, there's Stephanie over there when we see my hand. But the embryo, far from being a part of a human, is a whole human. The way we can explain that further, if we have time, is to talk about how scientists distinguish different cell types. There's a great paper by a scientist by the name of Dr. Maureen Kondik, and she writes the best scientific explanation I've ever heard for life beginning at fertilization. And within this paper, she says, when scientists want to distinguish one cell type from another cell type, they look at two criteria, cell composition and cell behavior. In other words, what is the cell made up of and what does it do? And she says, by looking at those two criteria, we can determine the embryonic cell is substantively different from the sperm cell or the egg cell. She says, take composition. The sperm is composed of the genetic material of the father. The egg is composed of the genetic material of the mother. By the moment of sperm egg fusion, the beginning of fertilization, when one sperm penetrates the egg, now that embryo contains its composition is the genetic material of the mother and the father. So by composition, it's different. Now let's look at behavior. Behavior of a sperm, find an egg and penetrate it. Behavior of an egg, allow for penetration. But the moment one sperm penetrates the egg, that embryo, by behavior, acts to prevent penetration. So by behavior, it's a different kind of cell. But from embryo forward, there is only a change in appearance and ability, not in nature. None of us can claim ever having once been a sperm or egg, but all of us can claim having once been a teenager, a toddler, an infant, a fetus, and an embryo. Now what I find with abortion advocates is the debate is less of a scientific debate and more of a philosophical debate. But before I enter into that personhood uh, discussion, which is the philosophical discussion, I want to give you one illustration that you can use to wrap up the scientific case that life begins at fertilization. Because keeping in mind wisdom, we want to use tools that really reinforce and illustrate our point so people can understand and grasp it. I know our culture is one which only seems to use digital cameras for the most part these days, but this is what? Polaroid. Polaroid, that's right. 
And of course, with old Polaroid cameras, you would snap a photo, the little card would come out, and would you see the photo right away? No. No, you would see that brown, black, smudgy stuff, right? If you were impatient, maybe you'd wave it, and then you'd wait a few minutes, and then the picture would appear. Well, I want you to imagine, you can say this to an abortion advocate, I want you to imagine that you have a Polaroid camera that you're going to use to document a vacation you go on. And let's say you go to a wonderful place, one of my favorite places in the world, you go to Scotland, okay, that's right, you see, because my dad's from Scotland, and you go to Scotland because it's a great place to go, and you go to a very famous place in Scotland called Loch Ness, okay, now that's right, now what's in Loch Ness? Right, you know, my, my granny couldn't see her hand in front of her face, but she swears she saw the Loch Ness Monster at a distance. <laughs> so anyways, you go to Loch Ness, you're on a boat tour, you're taking in the beautiful green scenery of Scotland. It's a little misty because it often rains there. And as you're on this boat tour, you're snapping photos with your trusty Polaroid camera because you like to have the photos right away to put in your photo album each night. And so you're taking photos and you turn to your left. And two arms lengths away from you, you see none other than the Loch Ness Monster. I mean, all the humps and bumps are sticking out of the water. So you turn your Polaroid camera in that direction, you snap a photo of Nessie, the card comes out just as the card comes out, Nessie goes underwater. You're not worried. Because you know, you now have the proof to show the world what they thought was myth is reality. And you're thinking about all the money you're gonna make by selling this image to newspapers and magazines and let's say just as you're thinking about all of this, a friend who's on vacation with you excitedly grabs the image from your hand to have a look at it. But your friend has never seen a Polaroid camera before, doesn't quite know how it works, looks at the image, only sees the brown black smudges and thinks it didn't work properly. So with great disappointment, your friend rips it and tosses it in the lake. Would you be upset? Okay, you know, my Scottish temper would come out. I'd get very mad. So if you're getting mad at your friend, imagine your friend responds, but it's just brown smudges. What do you care about brown smudges for? And you'd likely respond, but it wasn't just brown smudges. Everything about that image of the Loch Ness Monster was captured in an instant. It just needed time to develop. And so the same can be said about who each one of us is today. We were captured in that instant of sperm egg fusion. We just needed time to develop. Given that the science and the reasonableness of that is quite airtight, that's what brings us to the philosophical argument, where abortion advocates will say, fine, they're biologically human, I won't dispute that, but they're not people. And what's happening in our culture is the notion of human is being divorced from person. And individuals are treating those as two separate things. And they'll say a human is what you are biologically, but a person is much, much more. And what they will do is they will look at the form and function differences of preborn children in contrast to born humans. And they will say because of those differences, the preborn are people. That is why we may kill them for circumstances that we may never use to justify killing born people. So the question is, what are those differences? and should personhood be defined by them. If you look at the embryo in contrast to the infant, we see there's the obvious difference of size. Then there's level of development. Indeed, the embryo is less developed physically and mentally from the infant. Obviously, there's an environmental difference. The preborn child is in the mother's body, be it the fallopian tube or uterus, unlike the infant. And then there's a difference of dependency. The preborn is much more dependent on their mother's body than is an infant. And so what abortion advocates are doing is using some or all of this criteria to deny the preborn their personhood status. They may not use these words, but the words they use fall into these categories. They will say things like, what about sentience? What about self-awareness? What about the ability to feel pain? What about being able to communicate in complex languages? All of that is level of development. And they will say, because of that, the preborn aren't people. And so all we ask of them is to look at an infant in contrast to a teenager and ask them to consider, are there any differences? And indeed, if they're intellectually honest, they'll have to admit the same four differences exist. So then we ask, would we ever deprive a born child of personhood status because of these differences? The moment they say no, we then bridge back to the preborn and say, why would we deprive the preborn their personhood status because of these differences? I'm going to go through each one of these 
using, and, and why our personhood should not be based on them, using a number of images from a very funny book called The Do's and Don'ts of Parenting. It's a, a visual book which shows what you should and shouldn't do with your children, and I think several of them really hit home the point that our personhood should not be based on this criteria. So this is the first one. <laughs> and as you can see, we have born children who, because of their size, cannot exercise in a certain way. So you say to the abortion supporter, is that child not a person because of its size? Clearly not. So then we bring it back to the preborn. I'll admit, I agree with you that the preborn are smaller than the born. But our personhood shouldn't be based on our size, should it? Or take level of development. And there are some games that we cannot play with born children because they're not developed enough yet intellectually. It doesn't mean they're not people. And then we find common ground. We use some wisdoms. I agree with you that the preborn can't think and reason like we can. Maybe they can't feel pain early in pregnancy. Okay. But if those things don't matter after birth when it comes to acknowledging a human as a person, then why should they matter before birth? Then there's environment. And we can all agree, pro-abortion or pro-life, that there are some environments that certain humans won't be able to survive in. It doesn't mean those humans aren't persons. Bridge back to the pre-born. I agree with you. The pre-born would not be able to survive in another environment outside the mother's body at a certain stage in pregnancy. But why would we deprive them of personhood status if those things don't matter before birth, after birth? And then finally, dependency. And as we can see here, indeed, there are even born humans who are totally dependent on someone else's body for their survival. It doesn't mean those humans aren't persons. Well, correspondingly, the preborn are totally dependent on their mother's bodies to survive. But that shouldn't mean that they are non-persons. In fact, when abortion advocates bring up the notion of dependency, what they unwittingly do is make a great argument against abortion rather than in favor of it. If you think for a moment about the vulnerable people in our society, the elderly, the disabled, families, mothers by themselves with lots of children, aren't they the ones who get the parking spots closer to the door while all of us have to you know, park a mile away and walk, walk at a greater distance? We make special exceptions for dependent people for vulnerable people, for weak people. If a two-year-old says, Mommy, can I have breakfast? Mommy, can I have dinner? Mommy, can I have lunch? And day after day, she asks for food and the mother deprives her child of food. Will the parent be arrested for neglect? Absolutely. Now imagine that child is no longer two, but a college student who comes home and says, Mom, I want dinner. Mom, I want breakfast. Mom, I want lunch. Over and over. And the mom deprives the child of food. Is she going to be arrested for neglect? No. Why? What's the difference? Dependency. The two-year-old has a greater dependency than the college student. Dependency heightens responsibility. Dependency heightens responsibility. So the more abortion advocates focus on dependency, the more they make a great argument against abortion. So what is a person? I once decided to ask my niece before she turned three, because she was very verbal at a young age, how she would define a person. And I just turned my video camera on and asked her, and this is what she said. Hey Monica, what's a person? No matter a person, a person, no matter how small. Brilliant. Who taught you that? Mommy comes to her and she has a phone. That's right. Are you a person? No. You're not? I'm a girl. Are girls not people? Are boys people? No. Who do you a person? You. <laughs> so I thought she had a great answer initially, and then I realized she had uh, a greater level of development to achieve, and uh, still had some thinking to do and learning. So I decided to increase the age of people I asked the question of, what is a person? And I was talking to a group of 7th graders, admittedly still young, but older than her, and I was talking to these 7th graders, and I said, look, if I was an alien from another planet who came to Earth for the first time, and as I encounter you earthlings, I hear you talking about people, and I don't know what people are, and I ask you, 
How would you define a person for me? And this one guy in the front row raises his hand. He goes, well, a person is someone with two arms and two legs. Really, I said, that's interesting because this guy, Nick Vujicic, motivational speaker from Australia, doesn't have arms and legs. Is he a person, I asked the students? Yes, they all agreed. Well, then I said, the definition of a person can't be having two arms and legs because he doesn't have those things and you're telling me he's a person. So what's a person? And I noticed this student in the back corner raised his hand and he says, well, a person is someone with feelings, someone who can feel things. Really, I said, this little girl, Gabby Gingrass, has a very rare condition where she cannot feel pain. As a baby who was teething, she chewed her tongue like it was bubble gum. She bit her fingers until they bled. And she never felt pain to tell her to stop doing those things. Is Gabby a person? I asked the students. Yes, they all agreed. Well, then the ability to feel pain can't be our definition. What's a person? Another student raised her hand and she says, well, a person is someone who can think and talk. Really, I said? Because my nephew Francis, when he was born, couldn't think or talk. He's still working on both of those things. Is he a person, I asked. Yes, they all agreed. Well, then what's a person? And I noticed there was this girl near the back of the room, kind of frantically waving her arm, trying to get my attention. So finally I obliged and I said, yes, how would you define person? She was kind of mad at me. She goes, look, with great frustration. It's really easy to figure out if someone is of the species Homo sapiens. And if they are, then they're a person probably asked her if I could take her to college campuses with me because she seemed smarter than the philosophy professors I debate. <laughs> but nonetheless, this girl was on to something. The one and only tie that binds each one of us is our human nature. If we acknowledge personhood by virtue of membership in the human family, everyone's safe. But if we define person as how you currently function, a certain level, a certain ability, having arms and legs, or being of a certain level of development, or feeling pain, then inevitably we're going to be leaving certain humans out. And this is where it's helpful to remind people, human is a scientific term, something we can determine objectively. Person is a philosophical or legal term which has had a changing definition throughout history. There was a time here in America where uh, women were non-persons, blacks were non-persons, in Nazi Germany, Jews were non-persons. So we see personhood, while today is defined by whether you're born or not, historically was defined by your sex or your skin color or your ethnicity or religion. And so I would say the term person tells us less about what someone is and more about what kind of society we are. Are we inclusive or exclusive? Are we selfless or selfish? Are we tolerant of the weak and the vulnerable or are we intolerant? I'm going to play for you a short video clip that I hope you'll use as a tool again to get across this idea to people that our right to life should be rooted in what we are, not in what we do.
If we think back to that SLED acronym, the differences between the pre-born and the born, as well as the same differences between infants and teenagers, the size of the pre-born, their level of development, environment, or dependency, all of those boil down to one thing, age. The pre-born are in the environment of their mother's body, because in our species, when you're that age, that's where you should be. The pre-born are totally dependent on their mother's body, because in our species, when you're that age, that's how dependent you are. They maybe can't feel pain at a certain age or think and reason, because in our species, when you're that age, that's the level of development you have. Abortion boils down to age discrimination. And if it's wrong to discriminate against someone based on their ethnicity or skin color or sex, things they can't control, then why is it okay to discriminate against someone based on their age, something they can't control? If those of us who are whiter don't have a right to kill those who are darker, we can ask the abortion advocate, does it really make sense for those of us who are older to be allowed to kill those who are younger. Taking all of what I've imparted to you this evening, what abortion does and how it's a human rights violation, that the preborn are human and should be acknowledged as persons by virtue of their humanness. The question is when we communicate to this, this to the culture, does it actually work? where I've shared a few tidbits interspersed in my presentation about how I've made certain points and people have got it. And I'd like to play just another short clip for you of several of my colleagues speaking of an outreach that we did in Canada this past summer where we took all of our projects and went across the country in something we called the New Abortion Caravan. And in each community we went to across the country, we took our signs and we put our trained people with them because we believe that good arguments need good arguers. And so we put people who are good ambassadors, who have knowledge, wisdom, and character with the signs to ask passers-by, what do you think about abortion? And they employed the same things with the passers-by that I imparted to you this evening. And this was the result. My name is Deborah Gilman. I'm with the New Abortion Caravan and I'm 21 years old. While doing choice chain, I asked a high school student what she thought about abortion. She said she had researched the topic extensively, both pro-life and pro-choice sides, and that she was definitely pro-choice. After talking about 20 minutes, she said to me, you're absolutely right, abortion is always wrong. Hi, my name is Catherine, I'm 22, and I'm with the New Abortion Caravan. While we were doing choice chain, I asked a young woman what she thought about abortion. She said she didn't know, and she took a pamphlet because she was in a hurry. A short while later, she returned and told me, thank you. I read all about it, and that's so unfair. And she took another pamphlet to give to a friend of hers. Hi, my name is Ruth. I'm with the New Abortion Caravan, and I'm 24 years old. I was doing choice chain on the street when a woman came up to me and told me that she thought abortion was stupid. In the midst of our conversation, she revealed to me that she herself had had an abortion. After speaking to Anita from Silent No More Awareness Campaign, she told me that she was glad that we were there and that she had vowed never to tell anyone about her abortion until today. Hi, my name is Lauren. I'm with the New Abortion Caravan and I'm 21 years old. I was doing choice chain and I asked a 16-year-old girl what she thought about abortion and she told me she'd never really thought about it before. After I described what an abortion does, she told me she was against it and said, I can't believe this is happening. When I asked her what convinced her, she told me it was the pictures that got me. My name is Micah Rosendahl, I'm with the New Abortion Caravan and I'm 25 years old. While doing choice day, I asked the young man what he thought about abortion. And he said that while he was adopted as a baby, he had never thought about abortion himself. He left the conversation saying, I know those pictures are real and in my heart I know that you're right. And I'm going to think about what I can do about abortion. Hi, my name is Francisco Gomez. I am with the New Abortion Caravan and I am 26 years old. So while doing choice chain, a woman walked past by me, and I asked her what she thought about abortion, and she quickly said that she was pro-choice. So then after we agreed that some choices were wrong, I pointed at my sign and I asked her, how can this be right? Then after she stared at the sign, she said, I don't even know why I am pro-choice anymore. And as she walked away, 
she said to me, I can no longer support abortion. Time and again, when we take the knowledge that I've imparted tonight, and we use wisdom, like asking good questions, illustrating our points, making analogies, and ensuring that we interact with people in a spirit of respect and being good listeners. We see people shift from a perspective of favoring abortion to rejecting abortion. So the question is, where do we go from here? I encourage each one of you to remember that Helen Keller quote about the power of one. And even if you're not going to be on the streets with us standing with a sign or going to a college campus standing with a sign, think about where you've been placed and how you can get the message out. If you're already a priest or you're going to be, the pulpit is a great place to start. Abortion happens more than once a year. We need to hear about it more than once a year. And some people are afraid to preach on it because within the pews are women who are hurting. And they're afraid that by preaching on abortion, they're going to be reminding those women of what they've done. A friend of mine who lost a baby shortly after her child was born recently put a quote on Facebook, which said to paraphrase, there are some people who don't want to ask a mother about a child she lost because they're afraid of reminding that mother of her loss. And the quote went on to say, but the mother doesn't forget she lost a child. Asking about her child does not remind her of the death of her child. It shows you acknowledge the life of her child. And there are many women hurting in silence who need to hear about abortion as painful as it may be. So they go to the confessional. And so they find healing. Unhealed post-abortive women are a great danger to other women and pre-born children. Because unhealed post-abortive women often encourage other women to do what they did as a way of thinking what they did must be okay if other people do it. I was once praying outside an abortion clinic in Minneapolis because in Canada, it's very difficult to get close to the abortion clinics because we have laws that prevent us from even praying within a decent proximity. And so here I was shocked in the land of the free to be able to be so close to an abortion clinic and I'm standing there praying. And as I'm praying, I'm observing the kind of people going into the clinic. I thought I would be seeing boyfriends and girlfriends, mothers and daughters, Mothers and daughters, time and time again, going into that clinic, and all I could think of is, are these unhealed post-abortive women who aborted the siblings of this teenage child, who are thinking, if my daughter carries through with this pregnancy, what does this mean about what I did two decades ago? But if she has an abortion, then maybe, just maybe, my abortion was okay. I have engaged teenagers on outside their high schools in a discussion about abortion where they have shared with me that they are pregnant and scheduled for abortions because their mothers are pressuring them. So we need to bring the issue into the open, bring what's in darkness into the light, remembering the words of the great Martin Luther King Jr. who said, like a boil that can never be cured so long as it is covered up but must be open with all its pus flowing ugliness to the natural medicines of air and light. So too, he said, injustice must be exposed with all the tension its exposure creates to the light of human conscience and the air of national opinion before it can be cured. So by preaching on the issue in a spirit of love, but always truth, we will bring people to freedom. I'll never forget being on a campus where a student came up to me. She saw our graphic signs. She shared with me that she'd had an abortion. All the while, she's pushing her other child in a stroller in front of her. This child came after the abortion. And she said to me, I'm not angry at you, but I do have to ask, what about women on this campus like me and others who have had abortions? How can you be here with these signs? 
And so it was a very hot day in Florida, and I had my water, which is over there, but I had a water bottle with me. And I said, well, maybe I could explain it through this analogy. I said, here, I've got my water bottle here. I want you to imagine that in this water is poison. If we drink it, it'll kill us. Let's say I grab my water bottle, I'm really thirsty, I don't know there's poison in it, I drink it, I die, have I knowingly committed suicide? She said, no. I said, now I want you to imagine you know there's poison in the water, you see me grab it, I unscrew the lid, I bring it to my mouth, you don't tell me there's poison in it, even though you know, I drink it, I die, have you just been an accomplice to my murder? She said, yes. I said, that's why I'm here with the pictures. Because a lot of people don't know what I know. A lot of people haven't seen what I've seen. And if I don't tell them, then I become an accomplice. I encourage you all to think about people you know in your social circle. Relatives, friends, colleagues. And ask the Holy Spirit in the next three days to give you the courage to bring the abortion issue up. To not wait for it to come up, but to say, hey, there was this presentation on abortion I went to. Reminds me, I've been wanting to ask, what do you think about abortion? Who knows where that conversation will go? But it's in asking the question and engaging people that we will be able to work through the issues in order to impart truth to set people free. You can also do what we call creative littering. On my little tour here of uh, Philadelphia, I went to the wonderful Basilica, and when I went back to my car, I noticed there was a lovely Lexus with an Obama bumper sticker on it right by, and I thought, well, I'm just going to do a little bit of information passing along. And so I opened my wallet where I have a trusty little business card that says the quote I used earlier, injustice that is invisible inevitably becomes tolerable. And then on the back side is a child whose story cannot be said from the child so I will tell it for the child. And I put that on the windshield of the car and I drove away. These are the kinds of things that we can do in our everyday life to help get the message out. And so I'll leave you with a story of an encounter I had of a student I already made reference to, that guy in Oklahoma who asked me when I thought life began, and I said, well, let's ask when science says life begins. And I took him through those three questions, and we bantered back and forth, and we quickly moved from a scientific discussion to a philosophical discussion, and we were talking about personhood, and he said, you know, I just don't think your evidence is, is correct. And I said, look, I said, I want to believe the truth. I'm all about evidence. I said, I mean this sincerely. If you can find evidence to prove that I'm wrong, I will change my mind. I hold the position I do because the evidence I have seen is more compelling in favor of the preborn being human than it is against the preborn being human. But I said, please, if you have evidence, bring it forward. He said, I have to go to class. And off he went. Over an hour later, I'm talking to another student, and I notice this guy have returned. And he's hovering. He's holding a piece of paper in his hands, hovering, just watching my conversation. When my conversation ended about 30 minutes later, he was standing the whole time. He approached me, he goes, I got some evidence. And I said, oh, fantastic. I said, let's hear it. So he's holding the sheet kind of close to his chest, and he reads me this quote, which was not at all scientific sounding, but it sounded just like uh, something like this. He, it said, you know, fetuses aren't uh, humans because they're dependent on their mother's bodies. I was thinking, well, that's not scientific, that's just a fact about them, but why should their right to life be deprived because of that? So I said, huh, that's interesting. Point if I see the source, and I'm trying to look as he's holding this close to his chest. Well, of all things, his source is Canada's leading abortion rights activist. I was thinking, what are the chances a guy in Oklahoma is going to hop online and get one of the <laughs> leading Canadian abortion rights advocates' comments? But I said, oh, she's Canadian, she's not even scientific. And then I started to refute <laughs> what she was saying. And to give the guy credit, he said, you know what? After we went back and forth a little bit more, he said, you know what, I have to concede. You're right. Your arguments made sense. And so I, I thanked him for his humility and his intellectual honesty. And then he dropped the B word, but. I just think in some circumstances, if a child is going to have a life of suffering, then it's better that they have abort be aborted. And so we started to discuss that, but he was focused in on a life of suffering. 
And in a few moments, I was to discover something that I have learned time and time again to the point that it no longer surprises me. The one issue that an individual is stuck on for why abortion should be justified is oftentimes something that they have had an intimate encounter with. The number of times I have talked to women who have said, what about rape? And only later in the conversation have confided in me that they have been raped. And so here's this guy suffering, suffering, suffering. We need abortion for reasons of suffering. And then he blurts out, my parents were crystal meth addicts. For six years, my father brutally beat me. I was in and out of the foster care system. That's why we need abortion. And I realized in that moment, my conversation needed to move from the head to the heart. And I looked at him with sorrow, and I said, I am sorry for your suffering. And they said, no, you know what, it's, it's okay, don't worry about it. You know, it's made me who I am today. I'm a stronger person, and he carried on. And so I let him talk. I just wanted to listen, to remember the words of St. Francis, who said, Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand. And when he was done talking, I said, you know, if I could just clarify, when I said I'm sorry for your suffering, what I mean is, I'm sorry for what you've endured because no human should have to face such brutal, barbaric treatment. But I can, I can certainly hear from you that has made you a stronger person and I can, I can only imagine how strong of a person you are, way stronger than me or most people I know because of what you've endured. He said, but you see, that's why we need abortion. And I said, but is it really either or? Either you're abused or you're aborted? Can't there be a third option that we offer help to people? And he said, but you know what? We can't help everyone. I said, well, let me ask you this. Do you plan on helping people, or are you going to turn into abuse? He goes, no, no, no. He goes, I'm into social work, studying social work. He goes, I'm going to be a social worker. I'm going to help kids. I'm going to help them get through that. I said, that's wonderful. I said, so don't we need more people like you who are going to respond to this kind of situation by alleviating suffering instead of eliminating sufferers? And he said, but we can't help everyone. And I said, but shouldn't we focus on the ones that we can help? And they said, but we still need abortion. And then I said, well, can I ask you a question? Have you ever heard of the book Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl? He said, no, I haven't. So I began to explain this profound book written by a survivor of, of Auschwitz. The first half of his book is about his experiences in the camps. The second half is his theories in psychology because he was a psychiatrist. And I said, in his book, I said, you can imagine in the first half where he talks about the concentration camps, he writes about suffering. He writes about the horrific abuse that he and his fellow prisoners endured. And I said, and he writes about how some prisoners in the face of suffering sought to kill themselves by running into the barbed wire electric fence and electrocuting themselves. I said, it's understandable that in that pain, you'd want to get rid of it. Just like what you're proposing to me in that pain, we want to get rid of it. But I said, you know, in his book, Frankel writes, he decided early on he would never do that. And he said, for those who felt there was nothing more to expect from life, he needed to convince them life was expecting something from them. And I just let those words settle in his mind. And he said, but some kids who are abused will turn into abusers. I said, you know, Frankel also wrote, the last of the human freedoms that can never be taken from us is the freedom to choose how to respond to our situation. I said, he observed in the camps that some prisoners were treated like animals and still maintained their humanity. Others became animals, but each chose. So why don't we encourage people to be like you and encourage those who are suffering to choose not to repeat the cycle, but like you to come out of it? And he was warming up to the idea, but he was still resisting. And so as I was praying for divine inspiration, I said, you know, there's a story I once heard that reminds me of, of all that we're discussing. And I said, it's about this guy 
He's walking down the beach. And the tide is going out. There is starfish all over the sand. And as he's walking, each step he takes, he leans down, he picks up a starfish, he tosses it into the ocean. He takes another step, leans down, picks up, tosses it into the ocean. And I said, as this man is doing this, another man is observing it. And he's looking at the, 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 the sea of starfish along the sand. So he approaches the man, throwing them in the water. And he says, what are you doing? You can't possibly make a difference. Look at all the starfish here. You can't get them all back into the ocean. And the man looked at the man questioning him. He stepped forward in silence. He leaned down. He picked up a starfish. He tossed it back in the ocean. And he says, I made a difference to that one. And I said, I know it can seem overwhelming about all the kids that need help. But instead of harming the ones you can't help, why don't you focus on helping the ones you can help? At the end of that conversation, I saw that student transformed. Our conversation, which had begun hours earlier with him asking me about when I thought life began, had evolved into a very human encounter where he vulnerably shared a part of his past. And we were able to talk about how we must always have hope and preserve the dignity of the other. That's ultimately the core of our message. That's the message I implore you to make in your daily life with each encounters you have, in your ministry life, in the church. And to always remember, not that you are merely one, but that you are one that you cannot do everything, but you can do something. And all the more because you cannot do everything, you will not refuse to do the something that you can do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stephanie. questions, but we'll formally end it for those that, that have to go and those that wish to stay for questions and answer, uh, they can do so after. So let us end in prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. O Mary, Mother of God and Mother of us all, bright dawn of the new world, Mother of the living, to you do we entrust the cause of life down, O oh Mother, upon the vast numbers of babies not allowed to be born, <clears throat> of the poor whose lives are made difficult, of men and women who are victims of brutal violence, of the elderly and the sick killed by indifference or out of misguided mercy. Grant that all who believe in your Son may proclaim the gospel of life with honesty and love to the people of our time. Obtain for them the grace to accept that gospel as a gift ever new, the joy of celebrating with gratitude throughout their lives, and the courage to bear witness to it resolutely in order to build, together with all people of goodwill, the civilization of truth and love, to the praise and glory of God, the creator and lover of life. Amen. In the name of the Father and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Father, and uh, thank you for those uh, who have to leave for attending. I appreciate your presence this evening. I know there's exam time, but if anyone does have questions, I'd be happy to take several as a group, and then certainly one-on-one -on -one I can do that. So are there any follow-up questions? Yes? Uh, what do you think of the, the impact of um, photos of the unborn uh, I'm thinking of you know, the, the ones that you can find on Priest for Life, such as just showing seven weeks, 11 weeks, so on. Mm -hmm. uh, the impact of them versus the ones that show the dismemberment of a, of a child. And mm -hmm. um, just as far as the argument that you will hear about, oh, if children go by and see that, they'll be so upset. Right. Good question. So in terms of what's uh, my view on the images that aren't of dismembered children, but just developing pre-born children, particularly as some people are concerned about young children encountering these images, I would say it's not either or, it's both and. 
So the images of prenatal development, especially the new 3D ultrasound, um, that's very powerful to use. In fact, we've seen with pregnancy health centers, when ultrasounds are done on women, they often choose to carry the term as opposed to abort. But what those pictures do is they humanize the child. They don't dehumanize the act of abortion. It's the dismembered images that do that. It's kind of like pictures of happy, smiling Jewish families uh, show us who was killed in the Holocaust, but not that they were killed. That's what the images of all the bodies piled up do. That's what those images communicate. So we, we need to do both. In terms of young children seeing the images, we always see a parent's reaction determines a child's reaction. A calm parent will have a calm child. Uh, my, my niece and nephews have seen the images, and my sister has very gently explained that some people hurt babies, but Auntie Steph works to save babies. I remember a young girl had encountered uh, one of our pamphlets, and her older teenage sister, the girl was about five, her teenage sister was with her, and she said, what's that? The teenager explained it, and the little girl began crying and said, why would the doctors hurt the babies? But every time the family prays, guess what the five-year-old prays for? That the doctors will stop killing the babies. So uh, children have functioning consciences. Uh, the question is, do we? And children often are that voice of reason. And it's the conviction the adults may have of some past sin they haven't dealt with that can cause some, not all, to object to children seeing them when in fact it's because it's reminding them of, of what they've done. And finally, the moment we take our children out of our homes, there's a chance they're going to see things we prefer they not see at a certain age. But if we were walking our children down the street and a five-year-old was being ta attacked by teenagers, I don't think our first reaction would be, how dare my five-year-old be exposed to this, but rather, how dare these teenagers attack this other five-year-old and, and hurt him. So great question. Any other questions or comments? Yes. Go ahead, ma'am. Tragically, there are situations where people will say, oh, you know, maybe there's going to be a complication with this pregnancy because of the different blood types between the mom and the child, as you're pointing out, this could create a, a difficult situation. But the solution is not abortion. There's ways to medically intervene in any kind of medical condition that addresses specifically the medical condition and doesn't result in directly targeting the child. So there are ways to help without killing and tragically that those other ways are not often used. It's just that that quick fix. There was another hand. Yes, go ahead. I just had a question. Will you, you know, I think the, within some advocates, like uh, Catholics and Christians are often big advocates for, you know, for pro-life. I notice yours doesn't make any appeals to uh, Christianity or Christian morals. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I've had debates with people where that is better to just try and do protests, do, do, do the rosary, do Cross and that help people off? Do you feel like it's one or the other, or do you feel like there's a need to just try and keep the secular? And other people argue that we need to make here keep God in here because otherwise you have almost had a conversion with them. Because otherwise you can have it's so ingrained, you can't make it make I'm just kind of yeah, good question. So the divide, you know, does, does the, should the message be overtly religious as some groups are? They're very visible in their praying and then trying to you know, Jesus loves you, God loves you, please don't do this, more religious language versus what I've gone through, which is more like non-sectarian, just science, philosophy. Uh, there's a place for each, but the key is understanding the place. There's a place for prayer. Prayer has got to guide everything we do. Um, a great book that one of my spiritual directors had me read was The Soul of the Apostolate, which talks about the busier you are, the more you need to take time to pray so that we are filled and the excess overflows. Um, so, Prayer has to be essential, but it's important even if you look at uh, Paul and the scriptures that we speak the language of our audience. And so where we are in a very secular culture, we try to couch our arguments 
appealing to natural law but using a human rights perspective that would resonate with people independent of being religious or not. So if they bring up religion or the Holy Spirit so inspires me um, in conversation that I need to come from a religious angle, I will. But mostly we argue from a, a scientific, philosophical, human rights perspective. And I would say when it comes to engaging people, what do you think about abortion? work with what they say, truly listen to them. Now, if we're doing something which is explicitly prayer, then that's explicitly prayer. But if we're going to try to engage people, then we begin by speaking their language and only bring things up as the conversation, as it would be a natural response to what they've said. You know, I often tell people, if you get everything I said, remember this. Listen. Truly listen to the person you're talking to. Not just what they say, are their faces going flush? Are their eyes watering? Are they appearing nervous? Truly listen and take in everything about them. And then the kind of remarks we say back should be a natural result to what they've imparted to us. That may be religious language, but it also may not be depending on what they've said. Is that answering? Okay, <laughs> good. Any other questions, comments? Yes? Uh, you mentioned the video of your the group of ambassadors that went Tour. Yes, that's correct. Can you just tell us a little bit about like how many are in, involved in that, and, and are you doing training in other groups? Like, for example, Focus is kind of really growing in the United States. Mm, Focus is great, yeah. yes. I'm just I'm wondering how, is this like a very small number of people doing it, or is it a growing number of people that are doing it? Good they're, question. They're very young. I noticed they're all very young, and they're very, you know, very articulate. And yes. Very successful. Yes, they're great. I'm the old one at 32. <laughs> All my other colleagues range between 19 and 27. So uh, yes, they're very young, very articulate. Uh, I have 18 colleagues, so there's 19 of us in Canada all again between 19 and 32 and uh, we are growing every summer we run a summer program the past two summers we've retained two of our interns there were six of them the rest went back to school this summer we retained six out of seven so that cross-country tour really inspired in them a conviction that they were willing to not lay down their lives because we in Canada we've set a deadline we actually have an 18-year plan for our organization to what we say is end the killing in Canada and so um, they're they're gonna lay down their lives for 18 years and we're gonna get this all cleaned up <laughs> so um, if you go to our website you can read our our plan but uh, so we see it growing and then we really try to equip other people in either other pro-life groups or other ministries that maybe aren't as um, explicitly focusing on abortion the way we do but they focus on any number of topics of which abortion is one so for example there's a great group here in Philly Generation Life and I trained a good number of their missionaries last night um, where we can get into other groups I'd love to speak to focus or uh, other groups we certainly try to do that I often speak to a lot of uh, pro-life medical student audiences as well as an increasing number of uh, seminarians those are my two main focuses right now med students and, and seminarians and now growing into nursing students as well any other questions or comments yes Oh, they're great there. Yes. Pope Paul the Sixth Institute. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. As you're pointing out, in Nebraska, a uh, fantastic, in particular, Dr. Thomas Hilders who has the Pope Paul VI Institute that deals with, of course, the problem, we have two problems. We have those who are getting pregnant and killing their children, and those who can't get pregnant and are resorting to things like IVF, where they're making 10, 20 children, only implanting a couple, and the rest are dying or being killed or frozen and a whole bunch of things. So Dr. Hildreth's group is designed around the idea that we can aid the sexual act, not replace the sexual act. So how do we help those who are infertile uh, achieve pregnancy in an ethical way by getting to the root of what a woman's medical condition could be, fix that medical condition so she and her husband can naturally conceive. So yes, they do great work. Yes? On that point, you, you talked about a couple of different groups like, like Hildreth and Nebraska, and you mentioned Generation X. Life. Or Generation X. Um, all the different pro-life groups that had their various focuses in the apostolate, my, my curiosity 
curiosity is how well, from your perspective, are these different groups networking with each other so that we're not kind of reinventing the wheel, but we're all kind of being able to work together and Good question. So the question is, how well do all these various groups network together so we're not reinventing the wheel unnecessarily, we're communicating, complementing? I mean, it varies from place to place. I mean, I certainly know I'm good friends with Christina, who, Christina Barber, who runs Gen Life, and I certainly know they do a fantastic job networking with dioceses. You know, they're in New York now working with the New York diocese. They've also just gone into Nebraska. So um, there's, and, and they um, also, to my understanding, have done some work with Focus. So there is some networking, and then there's some groups that don't. So it, it really depends. I know I can speak from our experience in Canada. Uh, we very much focus on uh, partnering with existing pro-life groups and and making sure we work in synergy together. We love it when Silent No More Awareness volunteers with us. When we were on tour, we had women from Silent No More, no More Awareness witness with us. We are more effective when post-abortive women are with us than when they're not. So as much as possible, we need to say, how can this message be complimentary? Yes? Can you speak a little bit about, in Canada, they have the hate laws in some of the um, states. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the precursors that led to that? Sure. So in Canada, yeah, we it seems that we have these things called human rights tribunals where if someone is offended by something someone else says, you can take them before the human rights tribunal and all this money can be charged towards them, lawyer fees and everything else as they try to defend themselves. Um, we do not seem to have the same freedom and sense of freedoms that you have, and I think it's because you have a more rebellious fighting spirit separate, whereas Canadians just go with the flow, we stayed with the queen, all of that stuff. Um, so uh, tragically, not only do we have to fight for pre-born children's right to live, but we have to fight for our right to speak so we can speak for them about their right to live. So we have, um, several of my colleagues when they were students have, uh, were charged with trespass, they were arrested on their own campuses for trying to do our pro-life exhibits. So there's a big battle. Um, thankfully we've had great lawyers that stepped in, often trained by American lawyer groups such as the Alliance Defending Freedom, which is fantastic, another group here in America I highly recommend. Um, have been trained by them and then they've helped defend our students so that the trespassing charges get thrown out and, and all of that, but it's a big fight. And then even worse is we're international, or my colleagues in, in England who uh, face even more censorship than we do in Canada, so uh, it's a big, a big problem, so embrace your freedom. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Yes? When's the next time you're coming back? When's the next time I'm coming back? Uh, oh, actually, well, here I don't have anything scheduled, so feel free to invite me. Uh, but I am scheduled to go to Denver in February to do a debate. So, um, but certainly I love, well, my main role is speaking and speaking to larger audiences and doing a lot of our media, which is why I'm moving to our Toronto office, because Canada's population is in the east. But the, the effect I love about moving to Toronto is I'm literally a drive away from the wonderful, cool states and cities right around Toronto. So, um, yeah, so I'd love to come back. I don't have anything scheduled for here, though. Yes? Um, I spoke with Thomas Walters about um, pro-life movement in uh, Canada, and he was aware of Claude Lanto. Are you aware of Claude Lanto? No. Claude Lanto, he's in, uh, look, I think he's in Montreal. And oh, I, yes, okay. I had occasion to go to uh, Ottawa in um, 19, Sorry, I can't remember back that far. And um, uh, there was a, a meeting of something I believe the acronym or whatever was IFFLP, International Federation for the Propagation of Family Life. Oh, okay, I'm not familiar with it. Um, I, I Googled it recently to try to find out what will happen to the remnants, but it's, 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 I think it's been dissolved. It must be, because it. For the most part, have a handle on the Canadian groups. That one isn't sounding familiar, okay. unless it's very French-based. We really don't have much presence in Quebec. Quebec really needs to be changed within, so they can use our stuff, but Quebecers need Quebecers. So yeah, so I'm not as familiar with that. Any final questions, or we'll wrap up. 
Okay, well, then I will leave this. His brother is coming up. I just want to do a little plug for our website. As you can see, it's here, End the Killing. If you go to End the Killing or you go to unmaskingchoice.ca, either way you get this website. And we try to take... Oh, that's odd. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. I think I just... Okay, good. <laughs> this website, my knees drinking tea. No, okay, so um, so you get this website, and we try to make our resources and information as accessible as possible. So the main thing I want to draw your attention to is this pro-life classroom on the right-hand side. If you click on that, click on it again, good. Okay, so you get, we basically take in everything I've imparted tonight and more and turn it into a classroom. Everything from the science of when life begins to pro-life strategy to what about what Judith Jarvis Thompson or Peter Singer say. So let's say you click on the science of when life begins. You will get a written description, but then on the right hand side, you get a four to six minute video clip where if you prefer to watch instead of read, we answer that question. And we do that with all of our lessons. So there's a written version, a little short video version, and then there's some things like what about implantation? So you can click on those things. They're short, they're simple, they're bite sized. So if you're in any way involved with even catechesis or teaching young people, this is a resource that, that you can use. So I encourage you to do that. And then also under strategy and training, if you click videos, because someone was asking about uh, tonight's presentation, if you go to videos, must be a slow connection. Yes, so all our videos are online and you can click a category. So if you go down to presentations, click apply, you will be able to get a link to a number of presentations, including my debate against the late-term abortionist at the Canadian Medical School, um, and a talk I gave at Students for Life of America, which is very similar, so everything shows up in the boxes. So, what's the website? Right, or? And the killing.ca or unmaskingchoice.ca and .ca for Canada. All right, thank you. And we do have some refreshments in the back if you'd like. Help yourself. And Thank I have you. these cards if you want to use them for windshields.
Okay. I think you turn it off. I hope it recorded. Hope so. It says REC, so. Okay. I think yes. you stop it. Yes, it's, it's, it's closed right up. here. I think it's closed up.